And I, I wanted to mention the covers also. They've got this nice contact sheet design um, of, of photos. And, and I understand that some of your photos are in the books as well um, as, as illustrations. So that's, that's a bit unusual. And yeah, it is. And I have to say I've appreciated the opportunity that both of my publishers, the first one and now Bleak House, has given me to do that. Um, the photos are sort of there to set the scene, and typically what I've done is try to go out and find a, a locale in San Francisco that's been described in the book, and tie to, I try to take a representative picture of that locale. Sometimes I end up taking pictures that I like so much that I'll actually change the book to, to move them into the, to the story, but uh, um, they're usually um, sort of intended to help set the mood or the context. And most of my writing, uh, as much as possible, I try to make a really uh, faithful representation of the places I'm writing about, San Francisco or the Silicon Valley. Uh, and so uh, that just sort of, I think, adds to the, uh, you know, the, the realis realism associated with the books. In uh, The Big Wake Up, which is the one that's coming out in the fall, the, the new one, uh, I did a little thing, something a little bit different. I took photographs of cemetery statuary throughout the world, different cemeteries. And uh, the book has a lot to do with cemeteries and actually grave robbing, so it, that seemed appropriate. So while the photos don't talk or don't sort of portray a particular scene in the book, they are sort of representative of the mood in a lot of the scenes. That's great. Well, let's, let's um, see if we could get you maybe to read from the big wake up and then we could talk about it a little bit. And, and okay. I understand it's about uh, um, Eva Perone's body. Yes, there's an interesting backstory on Eva Perone, but uh, perhaps I'll just read yeah, the first the, a little bit, great. and then we can talk about that. So, so this is Mark Coggins reading from his new novel, The Big Wake Up. Yes, and I'm going to read the first chapter, which is called from the first chapter, which is called Cable Car Crunch, and as you'll see uh, fairly quickly, the chapter starts out. In a, in a fairly frivolous way, but unfortunately gets very serious very quickly. Are you hoping for a souvenir or checking to see if they're your size? The woman doing the talking was holding, holding a towering stack of pastel-colored panties. We were the only two in the missing sock laundromat. I was there because doing my laundry in the middle of the workday seemed the best investment I could make in my flagging private eye business. She was there, apparently, because even Victoria's Secret underwear models have to do the wash. There was no question I'd been staring at her. I don't usually associate tweed with sexy, but she shoot horn her extravagant, extravagant curves into a vest and jacket made of the stuff, and on her it was positively purient. The jacket just came over her hips, and then a pair of clingy jeans took over and traveled the length of her long stem legs to some pointy brown boots. Given the alternative between watching my fantastic four bedsheets go through the spin cycle and taking her in while she folded and stacked her unmentionables, the question of eyeball allegiance was never in doubt. I sat up straighter in the plastic lawn chair I'd been camped in. Doesn't matter what size they are, they're not my color. A smile pulled at the corners of her mouth and she leaned down to put the stack of panties and the nylon duffel bag at her feet. When she had situated them just so, she yanked the drawstring closed and swung the bag over her shoulder. She flipped back apricot blonde hair, then reached into the open dryer. Mirth and green light shone in her eyes. She gestured for me to hold my hand, out my hand and press something warm and spongy into it. Well, here's your souvenir then, a fabric softener sheet. I laughed and watched as she plopped a tweed newsboy cap onto her head, collected an oversized umbrella from near the door, and went out onto Hyde Street in a driving San Francisco rainstorm. She gave me a two-fingered wave through the plate glass and then jogged across the street to stand with an older woman at the cable car stop on the corner of, at Union in front of the Swenson's ice cream parlor. That particular Swenson's was the original, opened in 1948 by Earl Swenson himself, and the promise of a couple of scoops of cable car crunch after I finished my laundry was the main reason I'd picked this place over the laundromat in my apartment building. The panty girl had been an unexpected plus. Sighing, I pocketed the fabric softener sheet and let my gaze return to the bank of speed queens in front of me. The machine on the end was shaking violently due to, due to my decision to throw in a pair of dirty Converse Chuck Taylors in with my sheets. I moved to rebalance the load and then heard the deep coffee, kind, coffee grinder rumble of an approaching cable car. It pulled in front of the ice cream parlor, blocking my view of the girl and the older woman. It looked completely devoid of passengers, and I thought how lucky the girl had been to catch an empty car so quickly. I've never been more wrong in my life. 
On sleepless nights, I can still see the next five seconds replay when I press my face into the pillow. The cable car seemed to pause on its tracks. There was a harsh, unzippering noise synced to lightning flashes, and the car accelerated from the corner. By the time I thought to look at the grip man, his face was turned away from me, but I could just make out two pug-ugly Uzi machine guns dangling from leather straps that crisscrossed his chest. I yelled something inarticulate and plunged across the room to the door. It was a short, drenching sprint to the cable car stop. The girl and the woman lay in a jumble with packages and bags in the gutter, their open umbrellas twitching and rocking in the rain like things possessed. There was no question of either being alive. The 9mm slugs had stach, st stitched a slashing line across faces and chests, and although there was relatively little bleeding, the damage was horrific. The older woman partic in particular simply had no forehead. The panty girl had less damage to her face, but the tweed fabric of her vest was chewed to shreds, and bright red artillier, artillier blood welled in pools across her throat, sternum, and breast. Both women peered up into the downpour with unblinking eyes. The, the awful transformation from teasing, flirtatious girl to broken ragdoll left me vapor-locked. I didn't know what to do. I sat on my haunches in the street, my hair plastered to my scalp, my fingers squeezed against my kneecaps, swaying from side to side. I might still be there if an apron teenager hadn't poked her head out, into the, out, of, the, out of the door of the Swinsons and let off a strangled scream. I blinked, then blinked again. I squeegeed hair and water off my face with my palm and reached across to close the eyes of the dead women. By the time I stood up, the teenager had retreated into the store. She tried to block me from entering, but I bowled my way back through to stand dripping on the tiled, tiled floor while she scampered back behind the ice cream freezer. Go away, she squeaked. Call 911, I said. Tell them, the gripman on high, tell them a, that a gripman on the Hyde Street, Street cable car is shooting people with machine guns. And then he goes on to, to try to catch the cable car gripman and, and stop him from getting away. 